and welcome to this morning's service of worship. Uh, whether you're a regular here at Sandy Baptist Church or if you're visiting us um, or if you're catching up online later. Uh, my name is Emily. If you don't know me, I'm going to be leading our service this morning. Um, and today, in our journey through the Bible in a year as a church, we reach the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and our minister Phil is going to be sharing with us from that later on. And the children are going to be looking at Deuteronomy in Sunday school as well. So I'm going to open with some words from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now those are the opening words of a very famous Jewish prayer. It's called the Shema. Shema is, is the first word there. It's the, the word hear. Although it's a bit more of an active word than that. It's, it's about listening and obeying. And the whole of the Shema involves these verses and then a few other verses from Deuteronomy and also from Numbers. And it was a really important, still is a really important prayer to the Jewish people. Um, it's something that they teach their children. And it's something that devout Jews recite every morning uh, when they wake up and last thing before bed as well. So they're probably words that Jesus would have recited every day. And they're a reminder to them and also to us to put God first and to put him at the heart of everything that we do. So let's just hear those words again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you because you are holy and powerful. You are loving and merciful. And as we meet together now in your name and in your presence, help us to put you at the centre of all that we do and to love and worship you with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our might. Amen. 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 Let's stand together if you're able and we're going to sing praise to God for his mercy and faithfulness. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Oh, no, we 
sent out to, to people who are regularly part of the church. If you don't get that and would like to receive it, uh, do let us know. Um, do take a look at that information uh, for to know about all the things that are going on over the next few weeks, uh, including our next seniors event, which I think is tomorrow, um, and our next tabletop sale, which is on the 25th of March. Uh, and there's also information there about our Easter holiday club, which is on Thursday the 6th of April. And there's also information there about another get-together for musicians that we're having. We had one uh, in November last year, and we had a great time eating together um, and then learning new songs uh, and enjoying singing <coughs> together. So if you're interested in coming to that, it's on the 26th of March after the service, uh, and do have a word with me afterwards. We love to celebrate as a church, celebrate birthdays and other special occasions. So does anybody have anything particular that they want to share this morning to celebrate? Have lots of chocolate. Lucy? <laughs> what are we celebrating? Hello? Birthday 
me up. Happy birthday. <laughs> Anybody else? I didn't see you at the back there. <laughs> Have you got a birthday coming up? Oh, right. Oh, well, you definitely still have some chocolate then. Happy birthday. Going all the way around the back here. Done? Oh, oh, well, I'll get into it. Yeah, give back to her. I'll pass that on to him. Anybody else? Well, we do give thanks to God that we can celebrate together all these uh, happy occasions. Oh, it's a long way to look at that. Now, as I said earlier, uh, we are journeying through the Bible in a year at the moment. We're following the chronological story uh, of the Bible throughout 2023. Uh, some people are doing daily readings, um, and then in our Sunday services, we're kind of going through different books. And as I say, uh, we are coming to Deuteronomy. Uh, if you are doing the daily readings, you'll know that we finished Numbers yesterday, uh, and we looked at Numbers a couple of weeks ago in our service. And if you remember, we left the Israelites camped on the plains of Moab, looking over the promised land, all ready to enter. But we're not entering just yet. We've got the book of Deuteronomy to, to get through first. And Deuteronomy is Moses' kind of final speeches to the people before he dies. He's an old man now, and he's been told that he himself isn't going to enter the land. But he speaks to the people uh, as directed by God. And he urges them to look back and to remember, to remember everything that's happened to them. Uh, remember all those years they've been in the wilderness. He reminds them of all the laws and commands that God has given them. But above all, he asks them to remember God's faithfulness and love to them throughout their journey. So we're going to do a little bit of remembering ourselves, see if we can remember some of the key parts of the story that's got us this far. So, what country was it that God brought the people out of? Who are you asking from, Alex? Egypt. Egypt, that's right. So, uh, and how, how long ago was it that they came out of Egypt? Do you remember? Anybody else? How many years were they in the wilderness? 40 years. Yeah. If, if you're doing the daily readings and you've read the readings from Deuteronomy this morning, it actually says it should be about an 11-day journey to get from where they were to where they've got to. 11 days, and it's taken them 40 years. Okay, they were rescued from Egypt, um, and to rescue them, uh, to persuade Pharaoh to let them go, God sent plagues on the people. Do you remember how many plagues he sent? James. Yeah. Ten. Ten plagues. Brilliant, yeah, yeah. What was the last plague? Oh, that's right well done yeah the death of the firstborn children and that was what finally persuaded pharaoh to let them go but how did the israelites protect themselves from their own firstborn sons dying what did they have to do yeah they put blood from an animal and Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they took the, the blood of a lamb and painted it on the door frames so that uh, the angel would pass over and their firstborn sons would be saved. So what's the name of the festival that God gave to his people to remember that? Anybody else? The Passover, that's right. And what did they have to eat? at the Passover meal to remind them of what God had done. I'll go back to Alex because he's put his hand over his What do they have to eat? Um, you know any of the things? Bread. Bread, yeah, what kind of bread? Flat bread. Yeah, yeah, flat bread, unleavened bread, that's right. What else did they have to eat? Bitter herbs. Bitter herbs to remind them of their bitter suffering uh, in Egypt. And one other thing? Flat bread. Yeah, yeah, flat bread, yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the shampoo and the lamb. The lamb, yeah, yeah. So they put the lambs all over the door and then they ate the lamb. So it was all about remembering. So all through this 40 years that they've been in the desert, each year they have celebrated the Passover to remember how God saved them um, at the beginning of this story. And they carried on celebrating it uh, just as God commanded them 
passing that story on from generation to generation so that they would remember what God had done. So Jesus celebrated the Passover too. And of course it was at the Passover meal that Jesus used that to institute a new celebration the night before he died. A celebration of his perfect sacrifice. No longer a lamb that had to be slaughtered and the blood put above the door, but now the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, who fulfilled all the requirements of the law. And just as the Passover meal helped the Israelites remember their rescue from Egypt, so communion for us, or the Lord's Supper, helps us remember what Jesus has done for us. So we're going to share communion together uh, in a moment. But to help us prepare, we're going to sing a song which which tells us to remember what Jesus has done for us. So let's sing. Oh, oh, oh. 
remember, we drink and remember, and we hear familiar words that remind us of how Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. In Corinthians, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So let's just take a few moments to do that, to silently talk with God, to confess to him how we have let him down and to receive the love and forgiveness that he promises. God of love and power, thank you that you forgive us and free us from our sins. We pray that you would heal and strengthen us by your spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lydia and Grace are going to come and help serve the bread and the wine. And as we've been reminded, we share this bread and wine to remember Jesus' love and sacrifice for us. Here at BBC we use gluten-free bread uh, and non-alcoholic <coughs> grape juice uh, so that as many as possible feel able to share in the bread and wine with us. Everyone who trusts Jesus as their Lord and Saviour is very welcome to share but if for any reason you don't want to take communion today that's fine just pass uh, the bread and wine by. As we pass the bread round, uh, eat it as you receive it, spend time in prayer and reflection when you receive the wine, if you could hold on to that, and we'll all drink together as a sign of our unity. So this is the body of Christ broken for us. So this cup represents the new covenant in Jesus' blood. So if you hold the wine, and we will drink together. So we drink together in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice. Let's pray. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so the children are going to leave us now for their groups. Let's just quickly pray for them and for their leaders. Father, we thank you for the children and young people that you have blessed us with as a church community. We pray for them and for their leaders now as they go to their groups that they will not only learn about you, but that they will meet with you and grow to know you better. Amen. Have fun. things uh, going on uh, in our fellowship for you to get involved in, different activities, different opportunities for prayer, and so Tracy's going to come first and then Steph um, and tell us a bit more about how we can get involved. Thank you. 
as um, as we said in our church meeting a couple of weeks ago now, and as has come in buzz details, there's lots of ways to get involved in what we do. We've got a little presentation which is going to come up, just so that we can visually see a few things, because sometimes all the information, well, it goes over my head. So, um, Sunday school helpers. Now, Karen and Phil can tell you a lot more about this than I do, but as you can hear, we've got a thriving number of young people in our church community. What we really could do with is some more presence, some more people, maximum commitment of once a month. It might be that it could actually be once a quarter. Now, what skills do you need? You need to be able to communicate. You need to have a faith. Do you have to be able to teach? No. Do you need to be DBS check? Yes. Can it be any age? Yes. So it might be something for you to think and pray about and explore. As one church community, children are not the church of tomorrow. They're part of our church today. And it'd be really great to see a few more people that maybe haven't tried it or did Sunday school before and haven't for a while to have a bit of a conversation with Karen and Phil to see where they might fit and if they want to grow into something within helping at Sunday school. Also, prayer support. We're often saying the biggest thing you can do is to pray for things. And then it's, well, what do we pray for? If you want to know what to pray for for our Sunday school, speak to Karen and Phil. They'll tell you what's happening and what's going on. And it would be really great if a few people would have them conversations and commit specifically to praying for our Sunday schools. TAC Talks, I think we were looking at one support, and Nigel can tell me if I'm wrong on this. Um, food and Inspiring Talks, Science, Apologetic, Ethics and more. The idea is to be able to invite people to come and delve a bit deeper, explore questions of faith and how that interlinks with other matters. Nigel could do with some help doing this. Um, hasn't had many offers as yet. And also... Again, prayer points. If this is something that's touching your heart, the challenges of faith and how people believe and the stumbling box of questions of science and, and the world that get in their way, have a chat with Nigel. Find out what to pray for. Hope Explored. As I said at our church meeting, last year was a season of developing foundations and relationships. This is a season of inviting people deeper into their faith um, journey with God, maybe asking those questions they've not asked before. Hope Explored looks at hope, peace and the purpose of Jesus. Three weeks continuous, possibly looking at start of May, that's not a definite. We'd like some pledges of support, whether that be time, whether that be um, prayer. And if you want to know more about that, then do please speak to me. Community cookbook. Bit different. Haven't done that before. I definitely need some help with this. It's come out of um, community, the wider community, those that are a part of the cafe, part of the centre, and some people in church saying, we want to help. We want to help with the finance of the work that you're doing. We want to do this with you. This would be a really great idea. Practically, what's that look like? I haven't a clue. God keeps pressing this as a good way for community to work together to fundraise for God's mission. It's a way that God can provide in a different way through relationship. So what skills would you need with this? Able to communicate. If you're a bit creative, if you know to cook, how to cook, um, if you've got some strategic skills, if you're good at fundraising, then please do speak to me because I'd really like to get a team of faith-filled people to walk with those that haven't yet realised that they're on a faith journey. And again, prayer points with that, let me know. Senior screen, already up and running and going well. It isn't 450 for the helpers that are nominated for the day. You get to watch a film for free. You get a free coffee, you get a free biscuit, and you get to meet some really lovely people with our chatty table. Um, some of it isn't deep conversation, it's actually quite light level conversation, but that then builds a relationship that then follows through into our cafe or into church or into house group. 
me and Tom have been walking with that and Linda and Leon as well. Um, but it'd be great to have some more people on board so that we can take it in turns and we can grow that ministry. And if you want some specific prayer points, points on that, if film and looking at building relationships in different ways interest you, then please do speak to me. Thank you very much. And Steph is now going to come up to tell us more about one of the foundations I was talking about that's going to underline a lot of what we're already doing. I'm trying to keep this brief, I've been told to be <laughs> succinct. Um, yeah, so like Tracy, I'm a member of the leadership team and uh, we've been going on our own journey as a team over the past uh, year and a half as we've bedded down into this building, as we've got a breath and gone, <sighs> okay, everything seems to be working, you can flush the loose, you know, people are coming through the doors. Uh, what is it that we're here for? And uh, one of the, the main verses, it's a e verse in Exodus, uh, that came to the fore right at the beginning of us getting the keys to this building, in fact, was, uh, God, if you don't go with us, what distinguishes us from any other peoples in, on the earth? Um, Moses says that to <coughs> God um, at a particular moment in time when God goes, that's it, I've had enough of you lot. <laughs> he hasn't said that to us, that's not where the leadership team are going with that one. But what is really um, has, has um, exercised us as a team is how do we make sure that Jesus stays at the centre of everything that we do? How do we ensure that Jesus, uh, through his spirit, uh, instigates what we do and what we do next particularly and one of the things that really happened for, for us that was, was really helpful for us as a team was that at the beginning of this year we got together and we had a diary and the first things that went into that diary were the times on a monthly basis where we meet for the Bible in a year discussions because we'd already got that underway and the second thing that we put in the diary was a new uh, and establishing a rhythm of prayer. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that as church communities, as Christians throughout the ages, there's, uh, there's always been habits of prayer, coming together to pray, um, and also habits of individual prayer. Why do we do that? Because we're followers of Jesus Christ. And if you, as when we get into the New Testament, it becomes so obvious that Jesus was a man who knew his scripture, and who spent time in the presence of his heavenly father. Now, if they're the two main things that Jesus did, then as his followers, that sets down a standard and a model of life for us as Christians. So, as, as well as encouraging us as a, as a community to get, get deep, deep and dirty in the Bible, <laughs> it's, an interesting, it's an interesting group of books, we're really going to try, and, we're trying to encourage and establish a community rhythm of prayer. Now, um, the one of the ways that we're going to do that is, is that on a monthly basis, we're going to start praying in the month to come. And that's going to be a bit more of a commitment. We're going to be having something called a night watch, and that will be between 11 o'clock in the evening and 12.30 to the following morning. Now, that's a big ask for some. Some of us are deeply committed to doing that. But, you know, you can get up in the middle of the night if you want to uh, at your home. But we're, gonna, we're putting down some gauntlets. We're start, sort of going, Lord, we want to take this seriously. The other thing we're going to do, is, which we sort of started to kick off last December, was have a 24-hour prayer on a quarterly basis. And so the 1st of April, we're going to start that as a community engagement. <coughs> so please put that down in your diaries. So from... Um, Four, five o'clock now, we've changed it, haven't we, Phil? Five o'clock on the 1st of April. I'm going to get, I have got it in front of me. It's the first weekend in April. From five o'clock on the Saturday to five o'clock on the Sunday, we will be having mainly silent prayer in our prayer room, similar to the event that happened in December. However, that will be interspersed with um, starting off on Saturday with a communion. In, in the prayer room, unless we, unless there's so many of us that we have to come in here, hallelujah, yeah. then we will also start our first night watch, and there'll be more information about what that entails as well, again in the prayer room, and then at 10 we will have our usual um, collective um, uh, non-silent community prayer before the service, and then we will finish with a praise and worship time 
in this space probably, uh, where we're going to invite as many musicians and singers and as many people who like to, to, to involve be in sung worship to finish the end of that 24 hours. So please put that date in the diary. We'll be doing that once a quarter. And then later on in the year, we will be having a week of prayer. So we'll keep feeding and drip feeding to you the kind of the, the community rhythm over this year that we're going to start embarking on. This is a new adventure for us. Um, so please come and see what God is doing. I can tell you, when I was part of the 24-hour prayer in their silent prayer, it was probably one of the most meaningful things I have done in, uh, in, in my entire Christian life. And I've been, I've been a follower of Christ for a long, long time. Um, and my husband was totally amazed that I was silent for 24 hours. <laughs> so um, please come and join us. Thank you. Questions? Are, are all these meetings written down somewhere? They're, they're, they're already in buzz. Okay. And we will be giving out more and more information as we go along, go towards the time. We didn't want to bombard you with too much information, but we will be drip feeding each one as the time goes on. But all, most of the information for the first is already in buzz and will continue to be in buzz. Okay. It seems appropriate just to pause and pray, doesn't it, <laughs> after all that. So perhaps if a few people could lead us um, as we pray, um, first and foremost, that Christ will be at the centre of, of all that we do, and perhaps to pray for, for some of those activities that Tracy shared about as well, some of the things that we're hoping to do. So perhaps uh, if a few people could lead us as we pray. Well, so much that's happened in a year, and... Um so much to give thanks for. We thank you for these apologetic talks that Nigel's been doing, and we thank you, um, as Martin mentioned this morning, we thank you for the meeting this week. I'm not just um, my brain, God and consciousness. And we thank you that there'll be regular talks, and for the prayer times too. All these initiatives, would you go ahead, and would you guide the leadership team? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lord and Father, we pray and thank you for uh, what a place of worship we can come together and to learn more about you. Lord, we pray and thank you for all the activities that are ongoing now, which we couldn't do before, which we can do now. Lord, that like this in the Bible, it's just to come to those with every bring them to be rest. And any changes that we have to be brought to you. Lord, we pray and thank you for the people overseas that are struggling and that are in times of need. We pray that we can have disciples that can go out there and help them out. Lord, we pray for those people that are being injured in that earthquake. Lord, we pray that they'll be found and rescued. And Lord, for the people in our own country, Lord, that are struggling, we pray that will be with them and support them and give them the strength to know that with you all things are possible. <coughs> and we pray and thank you for everything you've done for us and it's precious and loving them. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you for strategy and we thank you for resource. Well, Father, we pray that our hearts are in the right place. And Father, I, let, I pray that um, as we look at what we're what we do collectively as a church, Father, that you prepare us individually. Um, you have power as you, you, uh, you work in us, Lord Jesus, to, uh, to determine um, what we can offer, what we can do, how we will affect your kingdom here on earth, Lord. Well, if your spirit doesn't go with us, then we, we're wasting our time. There's nothing that's different about us. Lord, we want to do, we want to live our lives with you at the centre of all that we do. We want to live as a community, as a congregation, as a church, with you at the heart of all that we do. And Lord, we've been prompted with lots of different initiatives lots of things that we can do. Lord, we pray that you would guide us and you would lead us. We pray that you would resource the things that you're calling us to do. And most of all, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be working in people's lives. We know, Lord, that 
we can't argue people into the kingdom of God. We can't, uh, we can't feed people into the kingdom of God. It's your Holy Spirit that touches people's hearts <coughs> and, draw, and you draw them to yourself. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be working in our own hearts and in the lives of, of those around us, that in all that we do, as we, as we gather together, as we seek you together in prayer, as we seek you individually in prayer, and as we embark on these different initiatives and, and we, we work with our own young people and as we talk with people at the, at the cinema, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will go with us, would be guiding us, would be giving us the right words to say, and that you would be touching lives and drawing people into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord God. Father, well, we thank you that your hand is on us and on this place, and we ask that you will be at the centre of all that we do. And Father, thank you too that you love and care for each one of us and for all of those that are in the community that we serve here. So, Father, we raise our own concerns and needs just in the silence of our hearts now, bring to you uh, what's on our hearts knowing that you love us and you hear us. And Julie's asked if we could also pray. You may have seen in the news about the very sad murder of, of a woman in Market Wheaton, Helen, um, who was a very active member of of the church there. So Father, we do pray for Helen's family and friends, all those who've been affected by this terrible situation. Father, we pray blessing on them. We thank you for her, for her life and her faith. And ask that, that even in the, the difficulty and challenge of, of this time now, that you will be at work, shining your love and your light into that community. Amen. In a moment, Phil's going to come and speak to us, but uh, as we continue our prayers, we're going to sing Speak, O Lord. It's a song which asks God to speak to us through his word. So let's stand and sing together.
seat. We're not going to read the whole of Deuteronomy, um, but just uh, a few verses from chapter 4. So we're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 4 from verse 32 through to verse 40. It says, Ask now about the former days, long before your time, from the day God created human beings on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything so great as this ever happened, or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds? like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Beside him there is no other. From heaven he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words from out of the fire. Because he loved your ancestors and chose your descendants after them, he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Keep his decrees and commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. Lord God, we ask that you will open these words to us now. We pray for Phil as he speaks, that his words will be inspired by you, and that our hearts and our minds will be open to hear. Amen. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Preaching is always a big responsibility. It's important every time anyone takes to the pulpit or the lectern to think <coughs> carefully and prayerfully about what message God wishes to convey. But there are some sermons, perhaps, that have particular significance in the life of a church community. Times when the person preaching might want to give even more care to thinking about the message that they wish to bring. One that always stands out to me was my, one of my fellow students on my college course. Uh, he was an Anglican vicar in the Gambia who'd been sent over to the UK for further theological study. Amazing guy, lived in London, worked on Southern Railways all night and then came up to Sheffield to do a college a day of college study with us in Sheffield on the Monday. And one year while we were there, he was asked to return to the Gambia just before Christmas to preach the Christmas sermon in the Anglican Cathedral there in place of the bishop who'd taken ill. This is a sermon that will be broadcast on national television in a country which is 95% Muslim. He spent a lot of time preparing that sermon very carefully and asked many of us for a lot of advice. I'm not sure how helpful some of us were. He knew the context better than us, but he recognised that was a talk that he had to get right. On a smaller level, I think many of us who preach would say the first time you preach to a new congregation, there's always just that sense of having to think a little bit harder and prepare a little bit more. What might God be saying in this situation? And similarly also, I think many would say the final sermon that people preach to a church or a group of people. What message from God should I leave these people with as I move on? Which is not a way of saying this is my final sermon here. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Depends how it goes, I suppose. It's a way of introducing Deuteronomy, which, as Emily has already reminded us, is in a sense Moses' final sermon. Or sermons. If we look at the, the verses of stage directions in between, there's three or four talks probably here. But this is Moses coming to the end of his time with this people that he's walked with for the last 40 years. He knows he is not going to enter the promised land. God has told him that. 
and the people are on the banks of the Jordan, ready to cross over. He knows he hasn't got long. What message is he going to leave for these people? I don't know how long Moses spent agonizing over what he was going to say. Yes, he was led by the Spirit of God, as always, but I'm equally sure that he would have turned this message over and over in his heart. He wanted to get it right. What do I leave these people with? And he says many things. It's not a short book. But I want to pick out two strands of thought that run through this book, run through this message. Emily's already introduced us to the first it's the idea of remembering. All the way through. He, he recaps, he retells so much of the story. He begins by taking the people right back to Mount Sinai some 40 years earlier. And remember, the adults of that generation have all died in the wilderness. Except for a small handful, Moses, Joshua, Caleb. No one standing in front of him as he's speaking was an adult at Sinai. But some will have been there as children. They'll have the memories of the mountain with the fire and the whirlwind and the presence of God. A defining moment, no doubt, in their life, as indeed in the life of the community. But a distant memory by this point. But as he takes them through the story, he reminds them again of all the key events, the golden calf, uh, the broken tablets of the Ten Commandments, the new tablets that God provides, the travelling through the deserts of the promised land, the spies are sent out. Ten come back and say, we can't do this. And Joshua and Caleb say, yes, we can. But the people listen to the ten and decide not to enter the land at that point. And they, they wander for 40 years in the wilderness. And there's opposition from various nations. And there's, there's opposition in the form of rebellion from within the community. And he, go, he tells them the story. And, and as he goes through that time, more and more of them are going to be able to begin to say, yes, I was there. I remember that. It's a real memory for them. But Moses wants to remind them, because it's important for them to have those memories, and it's important for them to keep remembering those memories, because there will come generations for whom they weren't there. He says that, Deuteronomy 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 2. Remember today that your children were not the ones who saw and experienced the discipline of the Lord your God. His majesty, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, the signs he performed and the things he did in the heart of Egypt, both to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his whole country. What he did to the Egyptian army, and he goes on and uh, through some of the history again. But he says, your children weren't there. They don't remember. But you do. You have had first-hand experience of these things, and you have the responsibility of passing on those memories to the generations who weren't there. And as the individuals who remember pass over time, the community needs to remember. To keep passing on those stories, and of course it's helped that you wrote them down, so that we can keep passing them on to us today. It's an important history for the people to remember. But not just remember for the sake of it. This isn't just an exercise in recapping the founding of a nation and the significant moments in their history. As we read through, and I know that we haven't, you know, we're just starting Deuteronomy, those of us doing the daily reading. So as we read through over the next 10 days or so, time and time again, we see that they're remembering so that they can recall where God was in all of this. They can be changed by the experience of remembering. Because it reminds them of their God, of who he is, of how he has dealt with them. And that affects who they are as people, which is the other strand that runs through the book. Time and again, this idea of being careful to obey, being careful to listen to what God is saying. Right at the start of what Moses said, Deuteronomy 1 verse 6, the Lord our God said to us at Horeb. And all the way through it, God said this, God said this, remember to do this, this is what God has commanded, live by his commands. Chapter 4, chapter 4, Deuteronomy. 
Now, Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them, so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God of your ancestors is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God as I give you. In the end, beginning of verse five, uh, chapter 5, just he's about to, to recap the Ten Commandments. Hear, Israel, the decrees and the laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. And there's many, many more examples through the book. God has given you these commands. These are to be the law by which you live. They weren't just a law for the wilderness. Now you're crossing into the promised land. You can't forget all that. That's not what it's about. (coughs) This is an ongoing way of living. This is how we've called you, God's called you to be as a community. And you need to remind yourself of who God is, how he relates to you, and what your place is in this. It's painful reading the stories that we've read of the constant grumbling, of the rebellion, of the sickness and death. Seeing how stubborn the people sometimes were. How easily they walked away from God. How ready they were time and again to throw it all in and go back to Egypt. Deuteronomy tells many of the same stories but actually puts a more positive spin on it. It says learn from this experience. Learn from everything that has happened in the wilderness. Learn from the mistakes you have made. Learn from how God has been faithful to you. And stick with him. Follow his commands. Live with him as your God. Trust him that his way is best. Remember and be careful to obey there's, there's two strands, but they're interlinked. You can't take the two apart. And they were like that for the Israelites, and I think it's the same for us today. We remember the past. We remember who God is, how he has been with us as individuals and as a community. And that encourages us as to how we live and walk with him into the future. Give some examples of what that looks like. I'm just going to walk through some select passages from this book of Deuteronomy. The word remember actually appears 16 times in the NIV (laughs) translation of Deuteronomy, 25 in the Good News Bible, more than any other Bible book except the Psalms. I'm just going to pick out a few of them to highlight how what we remember from the past enables us to learn and remain faithful in the future. Deuteronomy 4. And verse 9. Watch yourselves closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. When he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fires to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sounds of the words but saw no form, there was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the ten commandments which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. Remember, he says, first of all, remember how this all came about. God came and spoke to you. God himself on the Mount of Sinai gave you these laws and told you this is how you must live. The foundation of living God's way is remembering that it is God's way. That was true for the people then and it's true for us today. I think one thing that the Bible in the year that we've been doing has perhaps reminded some of us is that God really does care how we live. The call to holiness of living is not just something that the church has invented. It's not just tradition. Of course, we must be careful. Sometimes some of the details actually come more from tradition, perhaps, than what God has said. 
But the principle that actually there is a way of life that God is calling us to <coughs> comes from God, not from us. It's rooted in an experience of revelation from the living God who calls us to hear what he says, to obey, and to seek to pass on that life of faith to the next generation. <coughs> Verse 39 of chapter 4 says in the Good News Translation, Remember today and never forget, the Lord is God in heaven and on earth. There is no other God. Obey all his laws that I have given you today. <clears throat> but then Moses goes on, it's not just remembering uh, the time at Sinai. He takes them back even further. In chapter 5, verse 15, remember you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Remember, he says, God's work of redemption and liberation in the past. Remember, God has rescued you from slavery into freedom, freedom to live for him and to call others to live in that freedom too. And if he could say that to the Israelites, if he'd rescued the Israelites, how much more from our perspective can we see how God has rescued us? We cannot emphasise it enough in going through these books of the Old Testament law. We do not follow God's commands in order to somehow earn his favour and buy, his, buy our freedom. <coughs> He has freed us in Jesus from the law of sin and death. He has redeemed us. He has rescued us. That has all already happened. As Jesus dies and rises again from the dead, sin and death and hell are defeated. We no longer live in slavery. We are free to live. Not how we choose, because actually if we learn anything from those people in the wilderness... How we choose will just be to say, well, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back into slavery. We're free to live as God chooses. The life of freedom which he called us to, which enables us to live to our full potential as human beings. And so we are careful to live his way, not as a straitjacket, but because as we live God's way, we find life in all its fullness. The more we experience of his presence and his love, the more we see how his plans are perfect in every way. But he didn't free them from Egypt just to abandon them. Chapter 8, verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. God leads. He led them. He called them to follow. And he leads us and he calls us to follow. And he eagerly desires that we will do so. But ultimately we have to make that choice to follow. And sometimes God needs to step in. <coughs> trying to help to keep us on track. As I said, some of the hardest passages in these books are when God steps in in judgment. But he could not stand by and allow a small group of people to derail the life of the whole community. Those times of discipline and correction and testing are necessary and they're still necessary at times for us today. As God seeks to enable us to be faithful to our commitment to him. To stop us getting derailed, going the wrong way, being led astray. To keep us on the path of life in him. Because life is not always easy and living for God is not always easy. We're not guaranteed a life free from any concerns and any worries. That was the problem that the people in the wilderness had. Why have you led us out here to die in the desert? We were better off in Egypt. Yes, God hadn't led them to a life that was instantly perfect and they had everything they needed right there, right then. 
He led them to a life of saying, I'm walking with you, trust me, and I will provide what you need when you need it. <coughs> and as they face the promised land, as Moses is speaking to them, and they're looking out, and they know, they know the stories. They know the stories of the spies who came back and said, these are people who are difficult to defeat. They're a strong people. We don't know whether we can do this. And Moses encourages them again in chapter 7. Verse 17, you may say to yourself, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. Again, it's remember. You're facing the difficulty in the future. You're facing the challenge. Remember God has brought you through those challenges before. And he's the same God who can do the same this time. When we face those times of uncertainty and doubt, God says, remember what I've done for you in the past. Remember the times that you've seen me win through for you and trust that I will do the same again. When you don't know where the next meal is coming from, trust the God who's provided for you in the past. When your body seems to be failing you, trust the God who has walked with you through times of suffering before. When your marriage or a close friendship seems stretched to breaking point, trust the God who's brought reconciliation in times past. When you think that this time surely you've gone too far in your sinful behaviour and there's no way back, trust the God who has always been faithful to forgive and restore. Because it's not easy to look back and remember the times that we've let God down. Moses reminds them of them too. He reminds the people of the story of the golden calf. Straight after God has said, don't make any idols, they make an idol. And he reminds them of the time when Miriam and Aaron challenged Moses' authority and said, can't God speak through us too? Miriam is given leprosy and has to leave the camp for seven days. He reminds them of those times when they walked away from God. And there were those times in our lives too when we distance ourselves from God. And we feel outside the camp, outside his presence, fearful and doubting. And they're difficult times to remember, but Moses isn't reminding the people of those times to stick the knife in. He's reminding them so that they can see how God is still there nonetheless. He does tell them the whole story at some length in Deuteronomy 9 and 10 of the golden calf. And of how God's anger burns against the stubborn and wicked people. He also tells us some of the details that weren't there actually when we read it in Exodus. How Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on his knees before God, pleading for those people. And how God remains faithful to the promises that he made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to Moses, to the people in Egypt. Promises that they will be his people. Promises that they will enter the promised land. God remains faithful and he forgives and he restores and he renews his relationship. So too, as we remember those times of wandering and sin and rebellion in our lives, <coughs> we remember God's faithfulness and love and forgiveness and restoration time after time after time. There's so much that we can remember. So many ways in which our ability to remain faithful to God in the future can be strengthened and encouraged and enabled by our memory of how God has been with us in the past. And if you're sitting there thinking that on one or maybe many of the examples I've given, well, I'm not actually sure I can think of God being that way with me in the past. Then take some encouragement from the context of Deuteronomy, <coughs> because God is saying, remember this, remember, to a, to a group of people, many of whom didn't actually remember, they haven't been there. But they remembered as a community. They told the stories together. 
and so it can be for us. We can read the stories of the saints in the church and be encouraged by how God has worked for them. We can talk to the saints in the church who are sat around us and be encouraged by the testimony of how God has been with them. And of course we can read the scriptures and know that we worship and serve the same God. Some of us have commented a few times in the Bible in a year that the Bible would be much shorter if we removed all the repeated bits. And it's undoubtedly true. But I think the repetition's there for a reason. It helps us to remember. To tell those stories over and over again. To remember what God has done for his people. To remember, of course, most importantly, most significantly, as we already have in this service, what he's done for us in Jesus, in his life and his death for us. We need to remember. There's an old hymn. Tell, tell me the old, old story, some of you will know it. And I, I love the verse. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon that the simple dews of morning have passed away at noon. How quickly we forget why we need to be reminding ourselves and encouraging ourselves to remember what God has done but we remember for a reason as we see God's faithful love and compassion to his people whether that's the Israelites in the wilderness 3,000 years ago whether that's ourselves whether it's our friends in our life today whether that's what we see in Jesus all of this we are remembering so that we can learn so that we can grow so that we can walk more faithfully with the God who walks faithfully with us. Because ultimately, the whole story, the whole story of scripture, the whole story of human history is about God calling us to live with him. A life of obedience and faithfulness. And Moses concludes his sermon in Deuteronomy by encouraging the people to make that choice. He says to them, if you obey God in the land, you will know peace and prosperity and plenty and the presence and blessing of God in all that you do. If you choose not to follow God, then be warned that that will result in suffering and defeat and struggles and exile. As God allows the consequences of that lack of faith to come upon you. And he gives us the same choice. To respond to God's faithfulness in faithful obedience. To know his blessing in this life and the life to come. Or to walk away from him. And to face the consequences of a life lived in disobedience. This is what he says. And I would say the same to each one of us today. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Remember that God loves you. Remember that God is faithful. Remember <laughs> that God will always be with you as he has always been with his people. Walk forward in faith <coughs> to the life of obedience that he calls us to. Amen. As we close, we're going to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness by singing together, Great is thy faithfulness. So if you're able to stand, let's stand and sing this hymn together. <coughs> Oh, God.
After a sermon like that, it was when we've got enough, when we've got this many people in the church, there's a good chance that there are people here who haven't ever officially given their life to Jesus. And so I just wanted to give people an opportunity to do that. And the, the analogy that God put in my mind as, as we were listening to it um, was of a, a couple who were dating and they've been, they've been going out together, walking out together for a while, but you've never actually taken the plunge and said, okay, we're going to get married, I'm all in, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for it with this person, and, and maybe you've never said, okay, I'm all in, I'm going to go for it with God, and the way that you do that, Jesus, uh, the way that you do that, so I'm very nervous about this, as you can tell, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think God might be calling one or two people here, you just need to say to God, look, I know that I, I've messed up in my life, I want to turn my life around and I want to follow you and I want to, I want to make, all, you know, I'm all in, I want to go for it with you from this point on. And if that's you, then um, come, come see Tracy, come see me, come see Steph, come see Emily, come see Phil, come see one of the leadership team and just say that's me. I think it's important if it is you just to acknowledge that and to say yes, I've made that commitment today. So I'm going to, I'm going to pray that prayer and there may also be people here who've never been baptised. And we are a Baptist church. We believe that one of the steps in the process of following Jesus is baptism. And Jesus was baptised. Um, and so if you haven't been baptised, that may be the next step for you. And you also, you may not be a church member. You, you may not have decided you want to be a member of this community. And there's a, um, we're a membership body. We can talk to you about that. So that might, there's, there's kind of... It's a walk. It's a walk of faith that we go on, and there are different stages that you go on, and you might be wanting to go from one stage to the next stage. But let's just pray. So if that's you, and I'm not going to ask for hands up or anything like that, we'll come to the front. I'll just come, come and find me or come and find somebody else and tell them afterwards if it is you. Just say, Lord, 
I know that I've messed up in my life. I'm not perfect. I've done wrong. But today I want to go all in with you. I want to turn my life around and I want to say that I follow you and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And I want to change my life around and I want to learn what it means to be your disciple and to follow you. So, Lord, please send your Holy Spirit to be with me, to guide me, to lead me, and to help me to live my life day by day with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thanks, David. Some closing words. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Lord God, as we move from this place of worship and into the coming week, help us to love you with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. Amen. 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 Amen.